We're on the last sprint to the end of the semester. So we have this week, next week, and then we're done. I'm working on the final exam review paper for you. So it's the document. We have the last possible day of finals, which is December 18th. The exam is 10.15 to 12.15. In here, um, I'll have all the information that you need to know for the final on that review sheet. I'm also going to give you the final exam that I gave during the summer as a practice final, just so that you have an idea as to what it's going to look like. And you can time yourself. Doesn't mean that those are the questions I'm going to ask you. I'll let you know right now some of them I'm not going to ask, meaning even that topic. But you have an idea as to how it would feel. Because sometimes that's also terrifying. It's like what the first quiz or an exam in a class is always so hard because you don't know what's coming your way. So I thought I would give you that. This week, we're going to work on allele frequencies and how you calculate those. We're going to deal with haplotypes. Haplotyping is a very strange phenomenon, but we use it actually quite a bit. Uh, we'll talk about the equations of Hardy-Weinberg, and then we'll talk about mutations. Resources for this week. There's nothing really good for population genetics that talks about each specific top idea and then the equations that you would use. So there's nothing really that great to recommend online. In terms of quiz seven, you say, what quiz seven? You're going to have a quiz as part of the final. So this is guaranteed on the final as being about 40% of the final, just so you know, because it's a quiz. So the other 60% will be reviewed. So you could be asked, generate a haplotype, determine if a population is hardy weinberg equilibrium or not. This, so you know, this is statistics. Predict allele frequencies given information about selection, OK? In terms of short topics, uh, you can calculate the odds of father or son and brother brother CODIS matches. We're going to do that one today. And then calculate years of divergence based upon mutation rates. So that will be Wednesday. Your quiz, they are scored. Go ahead. Sure. That's stupid. It's 5% versus the rest? Sure. So for the quiz, um, it was a high score. There were differences in the short answer and the long answer between the two different versions. So for some of them, namely if you had guinea pigs or you had the GT combination, you got extra points added on to make the averages match up. I figure you would appreciate having the score raised as opposed to having the other that were higher lowered. Um, but we talked about these answers last time. So guinea pigs, they were dealing with class one because it's the only way to logically explain how the numbers were increasing from generation to generation. If you think about on a computer, if you do a cut and paste, you only get to cut and paste once. But if you copy paste, you can copy and paste a whole bunch of times. Uh, centromeres, lots of people got that one right. AT, most people figure out apex probes. That was fun. The GT. Um, the people who had um, GT, they usually didn't tell me, that, or they would say that was apex probes and described everything else perfectly, but they just didn't say the probes right. The most common mistake for the long question was you were flat out asked, tell me what type of probe you're using, and then justify it. Like it, it was like the first thing that you were asked to do. And a lot of you didn't, you just started drawing pictures. So if you look at it and say, I drew my pictures correctly, there was more for you to answer, and you just blew past it. The extra credit, uh, I told you about the complementary probes or strands. Um, one of you got the extra credit point, and it's because you said sequence. So just saying, uh, the high score turned out to be 42 out of 40. And it's because of the score adjustments. That's the reason why they got that score, just so you know. Um, although it just dawned on me, I goofed it up, so I can't give you your scores back. 
there's something actually I didn't do correctly. So yeah, you're not getting your scores back. So if you look online, those those for some of you, actually half of you, they're not the correct scores. Because it, it just dawned on me, I didn't add things up correctly. No, meaning they need to go up. Yeah, it's not it's not a lower, it's not a lower, it's an it's an up. It's an up. Breathe, breathe. Anyway, we're gonna be dealing with topic number one, which is allele frequencies. For those of you who've taken 312, this should be pretty easy. So the idea of a gene pool is an evolution concept or a population ecology, or population ecology, population biology and population genetics idea. The basic idea is you take all of the alleles that exist within a population, whatever a population means, we're going to take all the alleles that exist. Typically, we want to think of this as one gene at a time because it's just overwhelming otherwise. So we could think of a very simple gene, like the ability to taste PTC or not. It's controlled by one gene. We are a population within this room, so we could have a collection of two alleles from each of us because we have, we're diploid. So each of us would contribute two alleles to this pot that we call the gene pool. What I could do is I can divide it up into taste allele or non-taste allele. And I can count up how many of them say taste out of the grand total and how many of them say don't taste out of the grand total. We call that percentage the allele frequency. That's how often you find that allele in that gene pool for that gene. So when we do allele frequencies, we're only talking about that gene. You don't divide out of all the genes, just for that gene. And when you get your number, it's going to vary between a 0 and a 1. We don't usually write it as a percent, because it's going to throw off some of the math later. So 0 meaning it's been fixed. One being it's fixed. Odds are you're going to have a number somewhere in between. Because we can sequence and we can use probes, we can be even pickier when we talk, when we talk about our allele frequencies. So we don't need to say the overall phenotype. We can start getting really nitpicky and looking at things like, which SNPs are you thinking of. So we can go SNP by SNP and calculate allele frequencies that way. We can go off of the number of VNTRs. So this is a variable number of tandem repeats. So we can go off of, for this particular gene, I have five repeats, and you have six repeats, and someone else has 10 repeats. And we can quantify that. So we can use all sorts of things to calculate these allele frequencies. It all depends on how nitpicky we want to be. It does help to do a calculation of this just to see how they go. So a population has these genotypes. We have 13 who are homozygous for A1, 23 who are, are heterozygous, another 17 who are a different heterozygous, 38 who are homozygous, but a different homozygous, 27 who are a different heterozygous, and then 10 who are an even different homozygous. So here we have three alleles, an A1, an A2, and an A3. Figure out the allele frequencies. Okay, this isn't too bad, promise. So we can calculate the frequency of A1, we can calculate the frequency of A2, and calculate the frequency of A3. So to do this, I need to be able to add up the numbers. And this is the hardest part. Honestly, this is the part that's the worst. Is when I look here at 13A1A1, how many A1s are there? There are not 13. There's 26. 
I have 13 of those A1s, then I have 13 of those A1s. So it counts twice. That's the hardest part about all of this, that dividing. So I have 13 and 13. So I've used that one and that one. I have those 23 right there. I have those 17 right there. If I look, I don't have any other A1s. It's obviously going to be out of a total. The question is, what's the total? So the total, because I didn't bring a calculator with me, so Excel to the rescue. is 128 times 2. How did I get that? 13 plus 23 plus 17 plus 38 plus 27 plus 10 gets me 128. I'm double checking 13, 23, 17, 38, 27, 10. Yes. The catch is for each of these, there are two alleles. That's why it's times two. Okay, so what do you get? This is out of 256. That's 40. So that's 66. If I mathed right. Yep, that's 66. If I divide that by 256, what I'm going to get is 0.258 or so. I'm usually going to go to about three sig figs with everything. Okay, let's try A2. So for A2, I have those 23, then I have those 38s, then I have those, oh, nope, I have that 27. What's it out of? Same thing, 256. That gets me 126 out of 256. That's going to get me 0.492. So I'm going to predict that this one here is going to be 0.25 because they add up to 1. If I have three alleles, the frequencies have to add up to 100%. If I add up these numbers, I better get 1. I'm going to fact check myself. So we have that 17. That 27, I have those two 10s out of 256. That's 20, 47, 54, 64. 64 out of 256 is a quarter. Yay, it worked. Is it difficult? Is it annoying? Yes. The catch is here, we only did this for three alleles. We have more than three alleles when we look at genes, especially if we start looking at SNP by SNP. So we can make this quite crazy. 
because that's what the government does. So we have this phenomenon that we call CODIS. CODIS, I didn't write it down here, stands for the Combined DNA Index System, C-O-D-I-S. And it's an allele database. DB is database. Bless you. So if you wanted to go to that link, they update it twice a year. How do I know this? Because during the summer it wasn't updated, but in the spring it was updated compared to what it was last fall. So these are fresh numbers as of August of 2023. So the DNA index system has 16 and a half million offender profiles, meaning they deemed you to be a naughty person and they took a DNA sample of you and then profiled it, along with 5.1 million arrestee profiles based upon them thinking that you needed to be arrested, and it turns out you weren't and the offender, but they still arrested you anyway. And then 1.2 forensic profiles, meaning we have these samples that just exist. This is all as of August of 2023. It has helped almost 700,000 hits with, again, almost 700,000 investigations. Have any of you had the pleasure of being called for jury duty? One, two, three, oh, a few of you. Any of you have one where it's like a, like one of those cases where the R word gets invoked or something along those lines? I was gonna be on one of those, but they ended up, uh, I wasn't called in because the person, or I was in the courtroom getting to hear about it, but the person pled guilty, had a plea bargain before, like during the jury selection process. One of the questions that showed up that they were asking is, because there were a bunch of people who were like biochemists and stuff like that, was, are you willing to suspend all of your knowledge about DNA and only trust us because we are gonna be far more advanced than your knowledge? and they make you have to say yes, otherwise they don't let you stick around. I would not have been able to say yes. I could say whatever they fed me, I'd be like, no, nope, I know the tricks you're pulling. Why do I point this out? We're not actually not gonna do a lot of the math. California turns out to have 2.2 million profiles. If you look at the total number of profiles that exist inside of our database, we have 13.5% of the total sets of numbers. What percent population do we have of the United States? That's right, 11.7%. There's a bias in our system that I'm sure some of you might be aware of or have heard of. And the fact that those numbers don't match makes finding profile matches be slightly biased. These actually turn out to be our numbers. If you wanted to see them, they're all from that website, so you can just flat out go to it. It's not like it's hidden information. Like I said, they update it about twice a year. Do you need to remember any of these numbers? No, why would you? That's dumb. What they do in making these profiles is they look at a bunch of loci. And what they're going to do with these loci is they're gonna look at, in these particular spots on these 20 genes, how many repeats do you have? So STRs are short, bless you, tandem repeats. I gave the old term, VNTRs, in a moment moment ago. What they can do is they can take your DNA and they can then figure out what are you, your number of repeats for these 20 different spots, these 20 different loci. And that produces your fingerprint. That is the source of the DNA fingerprint. Step number one is they want to sex you. Being fully aware that this is a bit more complicated than 
the simplicity that they're going with. They don't go after, do you have an XX or are you an XY? What they do instead is they look for a gene where it is different based upon who you are. There is a gene called amylogenin. And what amylogenin turns out to be is it's found on the X and on the Y chromosome. And it turns out if they PCR up this little itty bitty piece of this gene, if you have an X chromosome, the fragment that PCR is up is going to be 106 bases. But if you have a Y chromosome, it's going to be 112 bases. So if you are XX, how many peaks would you see or how many lines or bands would you see on a gel? One. But if you were XY, two. And that's how they say, oh, yes, we think the suspect is a male because they use this PCR. You should also have the thought, these are six base pairs apart. How are you going to see that? Like on a gel, how would you ever see this? This is going to be the type of gel that you use for DNA sequencing, for Sanger sequencing. This is not a normal gel that you would use. So that they just use to figure out XX versus XY. After that, what they're going to do is look at these other 20 spots. Again, there are 20 of them. You don't need to remember this. But what they do is in each of these different loci, and they're all over the genome, they're going to look at how many repeats do you happen to have. And based upon how the PCR goes, you're going to get different size bands. You can be homozygous, which means you would have the same number of bands and we only see one peak that shows up. Or you can be heterozygous, where we would see two different peaks. The way that we write what your genotype is, is we would say, for whatever it is, like THO1, we would say you are 6 and 12. Meaning, for the locus, THO1, you have six copies on one of your chromosomes, and your other chromosome has 12 copies. And this would be part of your DNA fingerprint. But they need to do this for many, many loci. So what they do is they don't run 20 different PCRs. They run two PCRs. And the way that they do that is they do something referred to as a multiplex. Multiplexing is when you use different primer pairs at the exact same time. So when we did our PCRs, we just used one pair of primers. But you could have used 10 pairs of primers if you wanted to. The catch is, when we look at the PCR products, what I need to do is make sure that they all have different sizes. Meaning, the size bands I get for this locus are totally different than these bands, which are totally different than these bands. And if I can make it so they're all different sizes, I can fingerprint a whole bunch of stuff in one round of PCR. It actually turns out to be rather nifty. Um, how do they figure this out? They, each individual crime lab, they don't do that. If you were to go to there, it's a website that sells it. You just buy it pre-made, and they just say thank you very much, and then they use it. They also will use different fluorescent uh, tags to make it easier to figure out what you're staring at. And the reports that you see look like this. So for this locus right here, is this person homozygous or heterozygous? Heterozygous. How about this one? It's easy. That's what they look at. 
And depending on where you land on here, because if you notice, there's a scale up top, they give you a key that tells you, oh, you have a peak right here. That means you have 10 copies. If you have a peak here, that means you have 12 copies. They'll tell you how to interpret, so you don't have to figure it out on your own. Actually kind of makes it kind of nifty. X, X or X, Y? X, Y, how do you know? Two peaks. Congratulations, you are now all forensic scientists. That's what it is. That's what they look at. And this combination right here of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 loci of the 20 is statistically going to be enough to give you the odds of a match within probably tens, if not hundreds, of billions of people. So it makes it so it's pretty sure. There's some still catches that come with it that make it so you're not as trustworthy. So, AFs, not how you use it. That's allele frequencies. Allele frequencies. There's no as. Stop. So, the locus allele frequencies tell you the odds of the match. This turns out to be a set of data that they're about 10 years old. If you were to go to that website, it gives you the 20 loci, but it's going to be several pages long. And the question is, why are they doing that? Humans, it turns out, and I've mentioned this a few times before, are an inbreeding sort. We like to look at our cousins and say, you would make great babies with me. You say gross to that. Most of human history and most of the world, that mindset that you have is not what existed. So, because of that, humans historically have pockets of patterns of inbreeding. That's what they use when they do a 23andMe. They're hoping to see that your pattern from this particular country or this region of a country is something that can be applied to people who have scattered since. So when you go through this web, that those data, what you will see is each page is going to have a different, quote, ethnic group, unquote. And it's page after page after page after page after page of this. The first two web page, or the first two pages that pop up are African American and Caucasian, which is why I picked those two, because scrolling past two pages is way too hard. And what you'll see when you look at it is they'll have all the loci running along the top, and then they'll have the genotypes going vertically. The way that they write the genotypes, or excuse me, more appropriately, the alleles, is they'll just say like five, six, and they just list like this. This is just a little portion of it because it, it's a big list. When you look at it, it's tiny right. The way that you interpret this is for this particular locus, which turns out to be THO1, is where I took these data. If you turn out to be African American or black, which I know those aren't interchangeable, but if you had for this locus, the odds of you having five copies within that locus is that frequency. That's the frequency that we would observe. If you're a Caucasian, it doesn't show up. It's a, it's a repeat that we don't see. But we'll find other combos that go the other way. So not all alleles apply across, quote, ethnic groups. So how do we find the odds of the matches? Well, we've done this before. It's just applying probabilities. That's all this is. So, what are the odds of having a 7, 9 genotype if you're Caucasian? Well, the way you'd figure that out is very complex. I'd find 7, I'd find 9, 
and I find what the numbers are. And I multiply them. So the odds, the probability of being 7 and 9 would be 0.1733 times 0.1658. I just multiply those two numbers together. And I get, let's make this bigger so I can read it, 0 0.0287. So this was if you were Caucasian. What if you were black? Well, according to this database, we would have 0 0.401473, which is that one times that one. 0 0.14733, which gets you a probability that's twice as high. So one of the questions that's worth asking, that's legitimately worth asking, is is this because this frequency is due to the fact that it's real? Or is it due to a bias in your database? Which one is it? And the answer is, off of this, I don't know. So because they tell you that the odds are going to be a match out of however many million or billion, what if you have flawed data in your database? Can you trust it? That's why they pay you the big bucks as a juror. Locus 1 has six alleles, and they're all found to be at equal frequency. We'll deal with that one in a bit. Locus 2 has five alleles, and the frequencies turn out to be 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1 for A through E. Got it. Locus 3 has four alleles, all with equal frequency. Figure out the frequency of being this. So, let's take this one piece at a time. Locus 1 has six alleles all at equal frequency. That means the odds of being A or 1A and the odds of being 1F are the same. They have equal frequency. So the probability of 1A equals the probability of 1B, which equals the probability of 1C, 1D, 1E, and 1F. What would that frequency be? That 1 sixth. Yeah. Because there are six choices, so it's 1 out of 6. Locus 2, we're told flat out what they are, so that one's going to be pretty easy. But let's, let's do this also for locus 3. Locus 3 has four alleles, also equal frequency. Okay, so that means the probability of 3A has to equal the probability of 3B, 3C, 3D, and that would be what? One-fourth or a quarter. Okay, this isn't too bad. Probability of 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D. So what's the frequency of you having this genotype? Well, to figure out the odds of you being 3A, or sorry, 1A and 1C, so that's the probability of 1A, and the probability of being 1C. I can figure that out. That's why I have four locus two. So then I have the probability of being 2E and the probability of being 2E. Then I have the probability of being 3A and the probability of being 3C. 
So probability of being 1A is 1 sixth. If I say and, that means multiply. Probability of being 1C is also 1 sixth. Probability of being 2E is Point 0.1. So that's a tenth. And I have two of those, so I could say squared. Probability, probability being 3A, a fourth. 3C, also a fourth. I need to be all of these at once. So what do I need to then do? Multiply them all together. So when I do that, I get a 36th. Then we get a 100th. Then we get a 16th. Which is going to be 1 out of 5, 7, 600. Which is 1.74 times 10 to the minus 5. Statistically speaking, this would be a match for 1 out of 57,000 people. So if we were dealing with Long Beach State, one person in the entire school would have this match, statistically speaking. But there's 8 billion people on Earth, so clearly we have to do better than this. The answer is, of course. If I dealt with these common alleles, let's just assume that we only have five major common alleles for whatever the locus is. Well, the odds of you being homozygous would be a fifth times a fifth, which is 4%. The odds of you being heterozygous turns out to be 8%. Why? Because it's actually two times this. Why is it two times it? Because I can have, let's call it A and B. So you could be A and B, or you could have been B and A. This being uh, chromatid 1A, and this one here could be chromatid 1B. So one from mom, one from dad. Because the, you could have them in either order, I have two options, and that's why it's double. It's kind of like when we filled out a Punnett square. You had two of these, so you'd have to add them up. So the odds of being heterozygous, if we only had five alleles to pick from, is 8%. So if we're just assuming only dealing with five alleles per gene or locus that we're looking at, all we need to do is just raise it to the nth power, and that just would multiply out. So if you want the odds to be 1 in a billion, what I want is 1 in a billion to equal 0.08 to the nth power. I can solve it for n using logarithms. We're not going to terrify you by using logarithms. But if we did, you solve for n, you get 8.2. So that means to get odds of a unique match in something in a billion, I don't need to test 20 loci. I just need to test 8. And that's assuming that the eight only have common alleles. That we know is a bad assumption, because that's not true. 
which means by only testing eight loci, we can get a match that is most likely unique. How you get your percentages, again, that makes some little funky business. We have 8 billion people on Earth. So if you were to test 10 loci, you should be able to get odds in one out of everyone on Earth. And if you go to like 10 or 11 loci, you get odds in out of all humans who have ever existed. Because there are studies that say that we've had about 100 billion people ever. So we can really make what seem to be on paper perfectly unique matches. Again, that's relying on the database being correct and not having a bias. So here's where it comes to be fun. So in California, we have 2.2 million offenders, so people who've been convicted. About a million arrestee profiles, and we have 144,000 forensic profiles. Grand total, add them all up, all the profiles that are in California, we have about 3.4 million profiles. Meaning we have 3.4 million sets of these paired up numbers for all these loci. So the odds of getting this random match, if this, if we had more time, we didn't have those two Mondays off, we would actually spend the time to do all this, but we're not. So what we would do is this number here is this number here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the odds of getting eight matches, which is 0.08 to the eighth. We're making that assumption. This is a bad assumption, but we're going to go with it anyway because this is the best case scenario. So I'm going to take 0.08 to the eighth power because I'm doing eight loci. This turns out to give you this. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 9. This is the probability of getting a match of this. That's why they're both in green. I happen to have this many possibilities in California. So all I need to do is multiply these two numbers. When I do that, I get this, 0 0.00565. If I take the reciprocal of it, it's 1 in 177. What does that mean? Off of our database, the odds of you getting a match is 1 in 177. Is that good enough odds to convict? Because what they will tell you in court is this number. The problem is, you're not looking at the world. You are looking at California. Would you put sentence someone to death? The odds were 1 in 177. You've had classes where two of you statistically would be convicted if you were willing to do that. Some people would say, yeah, that's worth it. That's good enough. Some would say that's not worth it. That's for you to make that call. Can you see how this can get confusing to someone who doesn't know genetics or anything about statistics? We're not saying that it's bad. We're just saying you need to understand it. We can also get weird matches that show up. And this is how people end up getting caught. And it's not because you have your data in the database. It's because a relative put data into the database. And does it need to be from CODIS for them to catch you? The answer is, of course, no. You just need your data in a database. Could you think of any databases where you might have information? I'll give you one. Ancestry.com. I'll give you another one. 
23 and me. No, 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 they keep their information for themselves. You sure about that? Did you really read all that fine print when your crazy uncle decided to do it to figure out what percent whatever he turns out to be? Because are that fine print is, the government wants it, they get to look at it. How do we know? Because it's been used to catch people. So, just saying. You might not have your data in, but if a relative does, now they have statistical odds to match it up to you. There is a bias inside the system. That is, there's something wrong with those of us who have Y chromosomes. Those of you who don't have Y chromosomes, you're aware that there's something wrong with us who have them. But uh, there's definitely some profiling going on because all the males turn out to be inside the system. And it turns out that if you start looking, you get really good matches with fathers and sons. And you get also pretty good matches with siblings. So the question is, how does that work? So if I were to draw this out, You have father, mother, you have the son. Well, let's just pick something for what the father's genotype is. It doesn't matter. I'm going to use A and B because it seems to be easy. A and B. If I look at this kid here, what is he going to be? He's going to be A and then something from mom. So if we call mom X and Y. So it could be that combo. Or it could be that combo. Or it could be this combo. Those are all the possibilities for what this son is going to be. Got it. So what are the odds of getting an A or a B? Well, if I work out the math, this, eh, let's color code it. The odds of this one here would be 1 fourth times 1 fourth. Or, sorry, half times a half. That's not right. Because the odds of that A is one of the two, the odds of the X is one of the two, or that combo. Okay. Half, half. Or I could have that combo, which would be half, half. Or I could have that combo, which is half. Half. Well, it's, you're either this one or you're this one, so I guess I need to add these up. Then I'm either this combo or I'm this combo. Well, I'm also either the top or I'm the bottom. So I guess I have to add those up. What do you get? You get a quarter. Or a quarter, or a quarter, or a quarter. That gives you one. Which is why it says 93% accuracy. Well, why is it not 100%? Mutations happen. So, how if we compare brothers? If I compare brothers, we're going to repeat this exercise. So dad's going to be A, B, mom's going to be X, Y. I guess that's kind of confusing written that way, but whatever. They're lowercase. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so I'm going to define the genotype of the first brother, and we're going to see the odds of matching the second. So what I'm going to have is the first brother and the second brother. So for the first brother, he could be AX. So for the second brother, the odds of getting a match would be either AX, we could have that combo, in which case we'll have something in common. So the A is in common, and the X is in common, yay. What else could we have had? It could also be A and Y. In which case we would have only that one in common. Or it could be B and X. So we have the X in common. Or it could be B and Y. Who's most likely to be in this system? The mom or the dad? Dad. So the X's and Y's aren't important to us. The X's and Y's aren't important because the X and the Y probably aren't in the system, especially if dad's in the system. So of these four, which ones turn out to be useful to us? This one turns out to be useful. And this one turns out to be useful. Because of my four options, only these two combos yield a match to the other brother that matches dad. Because again, she's probably not in the system, so who cares? So the odds of this combo was what? What is it? It's a fourth. Why? Half and half. The odds of any genotype is always going to be a fourth. So what are the odds of this match? Well, it's a fourth or it's the other fourth. Because remember, the odds of this match is a fourth. The odds of this match is a fourth. But since I have an or in between, I have to add them. If I want there to be a match, I need to have this one and I need this one. So in between, I have to multiply them. So what's that going to give you? A fourth times a half. That gives you an eighth. So the answer is an eighth. No, it isn't. This was if the first brother is AX. Well, what could the first brother also be? AY. What else could the first brother be? BX. What else could the first brother be? BY. If I repeat the logic of this one here, what should the number be? Not one fourth, one eighth. Repeat the logic here, one eighth. Repeat the logic here, one eighth. So if I repeat the logic of trying to make these matches, I get an eighth, an eighth, and an eighth. But since I have one, two, three, four options, I need to add them up. So what do you get if you add up four eighths? You get? One half.
which is why that's pretty close to one half. So if your dad's in the system, the odds of siblings being able to get caught is one half odds. Meaning having a match. If dad's in the system, the odds of being able to match up to brothers is one half. And this turns out to work out, if you were to do this then for all 20 loci, you still get about a one half. So if your dad's in the system, the odds of a son being able to get caught from being in the system is a perfect score. If dad's in the system and one brother is in it, what's the odds of being able to find a match to the other brother? 50%. And we can keep doing this, and we can see how it will dilute further down you go. But it's how they can use relatives to calculate odds of a match. So we can do this for uncles, we can, and grandfather. We can keep going if we had to. Consider one codice. Go ahead. Sarah codis locus and assume that both parents are heterozygous for different alleles. So using what we just did, meaning this. What's the probability that the father and son will match for one of the alleles? It's 100%. How do I know? Didn't we just show it? We showed it. What's the probability that the two brothers will match for one of the alleles of the pair? Well, isn't that what we did here? Turns out to be a half. What's the probability that the brothers will match both alleles? Hmm. To answer this one, I'm going to use the same approach as I did this one. Where what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with one scenario and then extrapolate it for all the other options. So it's work for one and then say repeat logic here, here, and here. So if I do this one, so again, a, b, cross, x, y. Option one. So we have brother one, and we have brother two. Brother one is going to be a, x. Well, if I were to do the Punnett square, a, B, X, Y, A, X, B, X, A, Y, B, Y. What are the odds of brother two getting also A, X? It's a fourth. So it's one fourth and one fourth. Because I need the A's to match and I need the X's to match. So if I then repeat this for option two, which would be A, Y, what would it be for the second brother? It would also need to be A, Y. So this would be a fourth times a fourth. So the odds of getting the two brothers to match is what? One sixteenth. So the odds of both matches at both alleles is 1 16th. How many different scenarios do I have? Nope. It's easier than that. So I base it off of, I change the first brother, then I figure out what's the odds of the second brother matching. I have 
these two here. How many different combinations can I make for the first brother? I can make four. So how many scenarios do I have? Four. There's four scenarios. So the odds turn out to be what times what? Four times a sixteenth, which gets you What's a fourth times a sixteenth? One fourth. Ta da. We can apply this, like I said, we could do this for aunts or uncles, we could do it for first cousins, we could do it for grandparents. We could do this for more than one gene if we had to. It's just here, these turn out to be fourths options. If I were to go with two genes, we start to get options that are instead of out of a fourth, they turn out to be out of a sixteenth. So it starts to get a little bit more wonky. For the first one? So what we have to do is have the brother match with one and then keep going through. But you end up getting a half, no matter what. Because here, technically, there would be eight combos and it'd be an eighth time out of sixteenths and it would work out. How do we apply this to anything useful, like medicine? We call that haplotyping. So as of Saturday, when I put this together, there is a little over 8 billion people on Earth, which is a big number, if you're not sure. You can see the link if you wanted to actually see the numbers and the counter that I used. And humans are quite awful in that we like to put everything into boxes. And the reason why we like to put everything into boxes is because we're judgy. It's why we have classification systems in biology, because we want to put everything into a species box, and then take all those species and cluster them into a different box, and take all those genera and put them into a box, and just keep piling it up more and more and more. I mean, hell, we do this to you in school all the time. We do this to you in jobs because we give you job titles. We do it when we ask you to pay money to the government because we put you into tax brackets. We like to put everything into boxes. So the question is, can we do it with genetics? And the answer is, duh, of course we can. And we're going to do so by looking at linkage. We're not going to calculate the frequencies, but we just look to see what travels together. So what I can do is I can start to gather up and cluster genotypes together. And I can cluster those frequencies all together. And I can do that by looking at some different things that we find within your DNA. So we can have these things that we call microsatellites. We can have those repeats. And how many of those repeats you turn out to have. That's what they use in forensics. We can look at things like indels and SNPs. And we can see how that associates with traits or not. But usually an indel and a SNP have nothing to do with each other, so they're unlinked. But sometimes indels and SNPs do mean something. Usually they don't. But every once in a while, if you have a certain combination of indels and SNPs, it means something to what we observe in you. It's not common. But it does exist. When these turn out to matter, when they do combine and give you a unique phenotype, that's when we call it a haplotype. So a haplotype is your combination of these weird changes that go on in your DNA that by themselves don't mean anything. But collectively, they give you a phenotype. 
Typically, we associate haplotypes as clusters of indels and SNPs. You can have examples where microsatellites kick in, but usually microsatellites mess with stuff a little too much. Microsatellites are just repeats. And the way that we define your haplotype is just basically just a giant logic puzzle. There's lots of ways that we link haplotypes to a whole bunch of genetic disorders and whether you're prone for a weird condition or not. We're not going to worry about the linkage part. We're going to worry about can you assign a haplotype. And in order to make a haplotype, you must have a DNA sequence. These do not work by staring. You have, and it can't work by PCR. You must have sequences. Probes don't work. This requires a DNA sequence. What I need to do with that sequence is fish out the differences. So I look at this here. What I have are 35 nucleotides for seven individuals, and they're color coded. Everywhere you see an asterisk, that means I have some type of S and P at play. Between these three, we have a deletion. Or you can consider this an insertion. It's easier to think of this as a deletion. And we have this repeat segment right here with also a deletion. So the question is, off of all of this, could we assign these into groups? The question is, of course we can. So this picture below is what we call a haplotype network. This is the explanation for the haplotypes. At least for the assignment of the haplotypes. So the way to assign this, and here's how I work these problems. I'm not going to write it out here because that's what the next example is going to be for, which I have a feeling we're going to have to do first thing on Wednesday, is for each person, what I like to do is off to the side, I like to make notes of everything that seems to be weird about them. The catch is, to say weird, I need to have a starting point. So I need to pick someone to be the original. Who's the original? Who cares? It doesn't matter. The assignment of a haplotype is arbitrary. It's just the pattern that's important. So typically what you'll do is you'll pick whoever's on top and just say, OK, you're haplotype A. And then what we're going to do is start to compare how do these individuals differ from the first person. Got it. Well, if I look just at person two, position five, there's a difference. I'm just scrolling along. That's it. The difference between person one and person two is this change. So if I look between A and B, the only difference is at position five. There's the difference between A and B. Now I go between one and three. Well, one and three, they differ at spot three, but they're the same at spot five. And if I then look, yeah, it's all the same after that. So that means between person A or haplotype A and C, it's position three. Why is it branching? Because haplotype C does not have the same change as position B. If it did, we would just extend the line and say you need to have this one and the second one. If I then look at A through D, if I look here, oh, all this turns out to be different. We have this deletion. We have this microset, or we have, well, it's mainly that deletion that seems to exist. Here we have a difference. This one here turns out to be a difference. That's the same here turns out to be different. So we have multiple differences. 
what we can start to do is list them. What order do you list them in? The order turns out to be arbitrary. So all I can say is between A and D, these are all the changes that were found between this top row and everyone else. So this one here, person number four, is D. So there's only one person there. The difference between A and D are all of these differences. If I then look at these last three rows, I start to fish out, well, what's different about them? Well, if I look, these two here have this deletion. These ones don't. So we have a bifurcation. If I keep looking, they still have that one. Oh, here there turns out to be a difference. So what I have is one individual has this one difference, which is why it's snip 29. These two here have this deletion. So that's why we have this end of note. There are two people here. So if you notice, the circle is twice as big as the other circles. This map here is explaining how do you assemble the haplotypes. It looks somewhat easy. It is. It's annoying and it's keeping track. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to make one ourselves, just so you know. Like I said, I'll give you your quizzes back.